What it is, what it is, what it is, brothers. What up, what up? How y'all doing, man? This is another episode of Black Brewers Podcast. My name is Anthony. I'm Philip, and I'm going to strive to get Anthony to say one less what it is each episode. <laughs> My name is Greg. What's up, y'all? That's going to be hard to do, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and we are here with Dr. J. Uh, I'm Greg, I'm going to let you introduce Dr. J. Uh, yeah, Dr. J, very, very world-renowned internationally and nationally in the space of DEI within the beer community. Um, I know she is a Richmond resident, I believe, and so... If she's uh, Dr. J, I'm sure she's ever been to Mama J's, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, yeah, no, this is someone that we all respect highly, and we regard her highly in uh, in the beer community. Uh, I've never been able to see her speak at CBC, but I've heard nothing but good things uh, from Anthony and then a lot of our coworkers over at Dangerous Man as well. Beautiful. We're glad to have you. Definitely. Um, yeah, we just wanted to just kick in and talk with you, man. I see you with the beautiful, uh, majestic background of the horse gallivanting in the back with the uh, awesome uh, geometric calligraphy going on. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we, we just really wanted to uh, just, just give, give you some flowers, just big ups to you. Just We see you moving and grooving out here, uh, uh, shifting things, and that's, that's beautiful to us. But uh, I know I had a question specifically being that you are the DEI of the Brewers Association themselves. Um. I got to be honest with you, anytime I, as I was kind of uh, peeping you, I noticed in almost every article that mentions you, the word diversity comes up. And I got to be real with you. Do you tire of the word diversity? Does that bring, I understand it's part of your title, but I know, in your, I know for me, just to be in an empathetic, coming from a place of empathy, I know I'll be like, ah, yeah, yeah, diversity, cool, but you know. It's really about this or, yeah, that's the best word people use. That's the buzzword people use. But like black garlic in the early 2000s, everybody wanted in their chips. People want to use diversity to, you know, define something that's not different, a.k.a. more people of color. How do you feel about that? What's your, what are your what's your real feeling like at this point in time throughout as long as you've been in here? How do you feel about that? Yeah, I love that you asked that question. And um if you actually look at my title for the Brewers Association, I'm the equity and inclusion partner. Partner. I did not mm-hmm. let them put the word diversity in my title. Uh, yes. So um, I, I actually have a, an article that I published about why I don't like that word um, and why I, um, it's not that I don't think it's useful. I think that it's misused uh, is probably the best way for me to put it. So I think, I always think diversity is an outcome, not a process, right? So if you do some other things, inclusion, equity, justice, compassion, diversity will happen, right? It's the outcome on the other side, but like you can't do it first. It's not a process, right? Or if it is a process, it's a janky process, right? Um, That's what tokenism is. Just going straight for diversity. So I always tell people, don't worry about diversity. Let's not say the D word. Let's worry about all the things that you can do that helps create a flourishing environment and diversity will just happen. On, it will just happen by itself. You don't have to worry about it. So, um, you know, so I don't like that word. I think the other piece is, you know, when I first started um, with the Brewers Association for five years ago now, a while ago now, uh, I was kind of working as a part-time uh, ambassador. So that was a person who was um, member-facing, doing a lot of public speaking, and I was their diversity ambassador. And I always felt like it sounded like I was like the ambassador from diversity. Like, <laughs> <laughs> hello, friends, right. I'm here from diversity. Right? And I always thought that sounded so terrible. So, um, so we just retired that when I, when I uh, came on with the association full time. Gotcha. Nice. I mean, you are well accomplished. Um, see, you got a PhD in philosophy at North Carolina. Go Tar Heels. Yep. Um, notice that you went to San Diego State. You know, you spent some time in Virginia Tech. 2020 Imbibe Magazine Person of the Year. So well decorated. And uh, how do you deal with being like moving up the levels of beer as far as I don't want to necessarily use the word celebrity, but like being like a recognizable figure in this in this, I don't know, tumultuous industry? Yeah, oh gosh. Um, I feel like it depends like when 
when when you see me or when you talk to me is like how I deal with it. I think um, in one in one regard, I I I think it's a there's a tremendous amount of responsibility, uh, and I think that weighs really heavily. I think you know, so I think um, there are probably not a lot of times when I'm like not thinking actively about like the consequences of how I present myself or who I'm speaking to or who I'm saying what. So I think the responsibility weighs really heavily. Um, I think there are days when um, it's really hard. I'm naturally introverted. So um, I do fine with people. It's not like I'm awkward, but I get tired. Like I would say, like if you're an introvert, like people, drain your bucket. If you're an extrovert, people fill your bucket up, right? And so a lot of times being a person that people recognize, like my bucket goes from full to bone dry, like very, very quickly. So I think I have to do a lot of like personal management, which took me years to figure out that I couldn't just be yes to everybody all the time. Um, you know, and I think, um, I think sometimes it's really awful. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I said, I mentioned tokenism a little while ago. You know, a lot of people are like, J Dr. J, you know, you're like the token da 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 on the panel or thing or whatever. Like, how do you deal with that? And, um, you know, I, I'm 100% honest. Like, I signed up for it. Right. Like, um, that's, that's my job. I signed up. Um, but that doesn't make it easy. Like, it makes it, really challenging sometimes. So, um, you know, I think in the last year or two, I've taken the opportunity to say no a lot more. And um, the funny thing is, uh, I get a lot more done now, um, you know, behind the scenes rather than um, kind of being out in front. Gotcha. My first question My first for you question is, what are you drinking, Dr. You Dr. J? Dr. J? What am I drinking? Um, all right, I brought this. Um, this bottle from Two Barns. Ooh. Uh, this is a Virginia brewery, um, fairly new. It is a, a dark farmhouse ale. It's made with um, about 25% estate grain, so grown on property, and then um, the rest uh, brought in native wild yeast spontaneously fermented i love the spontaneous mixed culture stuff that's kind of my jam so um i've not had this before so i'm kind of excited to taste it um farmhouse ales are wonderful and i love that it's dark you know i think there's going to be a single like lovely character in there, so is that a f um, well you never had it for us i can't even ask you questions oh wow about beautiful it. color let me see if i can get and to the you floor. said that's out of virginia yeah. yep Yep. Okay. That looks amazing, by the way. It's pouring beautifully. All right. There we go. So you probably, it's looking a little darker on camera than it is, but it's, it's got like, um, like a deep copper, really beautiful, light tan head. Um, not too funky on the smell. So I don't know how they, what, what kind of culture they pull, but. I know those dark yeast tend to be funky on the sour when it comes to the souring. The dark souring yeast tends to be end up always being. Yeah, you look like that was a little funky. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's great. Um, so there's, I'm gonna guess there's a whole bunch of special bee in here because it has that like really big um, dark, you know, fruit like currant, raisin, like that really. Nice. Um, Think about a Belgian double country, right? Like that kind of really. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you don't like raisins, man, you're like this, but uh, I'm digging <laughs> it. So. Well, cheers. Cheers, yeah. Cheers. We are we are also drinking our own individual beers here. Uh, I am currently drinking a Big Passion Goza from Dangerous Man Brewing, which is local here to Minneapolis. I am drinking a Great Lakes Oktoberfest Marzen Style Lager. It's the season. Yeah, I'm sipping on this, uh, this the Empress. It's a fruited wheat from uh, Back Channel. They're just doing a collab at Dangerous Man today. So it's got a little kiwi, mango, and tangerine. They slid it through. Uh, I'm enjoying this wheat. Uh, it's, it's quite, it's fantastic. It's, it's light, it's bright, it's colorful. Uh, it's just got a nice sweetness to it. It's light. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm with it. I'm, I support this one. Love it. Yeah, we are finally like, um, 
cooling down a little bit in Virginia. So like, I feel like I want to start getting into the fall beers. I love the, the dark lagers, like the fest beers, the Martins, all that stuff is wonderful. So I'm grateful we got a cool like 70 degree day today. So I can get into something a little, a little more fall. A little, a little sweat 73 degrees is cool to you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, shout out to. I mean, it's, 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 it's like not 90, so it's cool. Gotcha. That's fair. That's fair. It's a contrast for sure. So I got a chance to hear you speak at CBC this past May and actually meet you at the Thrive uh, Workshop. Can you tell us about what that experience was like for you personally and professionally? Uh, Thrive in general? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I think maybe this goes back to what we were talking about with diversity right like that is this word functioning like we want to function is it allowing us to teach people what we want to teach does it allow us to come together and have the kind of conversations we want to have and you know i um like everybody else 2020 to 2022 were like like just some motherfuckers of, of a book in. Am I allowed to cuss in your show? They were some, they were like those, that two year period was just wild. You know, it was personally wild, it was collectively wild. A lot of pain, a lot of trauma. Um, and you know, what I found was that you know, from the summer of 2020, um, you know, I, I was asked to do a lot and I, said yes a lot. Um, and then, you know, and then COVID happened, right? So I, I think I was as busy as I've ever been in my life during maybe one of the like hardest physical times to move. And I moved, right? Like I, I moved from, from one house to another in the middle. Of time. Um, and one of the things that I found was a lot of people we're, we're trying really hard to kind of work with their racial equity programming specifically and finding that that was really hard work to do when people were not well or like mentally or physically, right? COVID gets you both ways. Um, and on the flip side, I was working with a lot of organizations that didn't have a kind of formalized human resources function. So you don't have to have a HR director or officer even, but you have to kind of have those functions taken care of. Um, and what I would find is like, it didn't matter how educated a staff or group of people were in the kind of equity and inclusion work, if they weren't well or they didn't have HR infrastructure to, to hang it on, it wasn't going anywhere, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, I started realizing that like those three have to kind of happen together, right? Like, you know, equity and inclusion work, wellness, both physical and mental and human resources all has to kind of be a triangle. And that's why I created Thrive. Um, so it's, it's really, it's the intersection of those three things and it's meant to be about thriving human beings. Right? That like that's the that's the conceit. Um, you need these three things to make thriving human beings. So, um, so at CBC um, this past CBC, that was the first time we've ever done the Thrive pre-conference, um, and well, that was wow. It was such a day. It was, like, it was such a day. I think um, you know if any of you are musicians or ever been in theater or anything, you know that like craziness before the show like where you're just like out of your mind and you don't know what's going on right? and then this kind of like once it's over it's like you burst something and you're like oh my gosh i look raggedy and 20 things went wrong <laughs> right but like but it happens and like you know so that that's what the thrive experience is like and um you know that was the first cbc that i hadn't do, done like multiple seminars. I kind of spent all my time kind of executing Thrive. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was such an evolution. You know, the first CDC I spoke at was in 2018. And I think there was like 200 people in the room, like blinking back at me, like, you said what? 
you know, uh, <laughs> they have like no idea what I was talking about. And then, you know, fast forward, right? Um, and we, and we had Thrive and um, God, what an amazing experience. Did, did you have a good time in Minneapolis outside of the CBC? Yeah, you know, I did. Um, the first day I got there, I didn't tell anyone I was in town. And I went to, <laughs> and I went to Paisley Park because I was just like, if I, if I tell people I'm here and I'm going to Paisley Park, people are going to try to come with me. And I don't want anybody to come with me. Like, I just wanted to, like, go to church and have my experience and, like, I don't need to talk to anybody, you know. Of course, I ran into period people while I was there, but uh, that so that was, um, you know, life changing. Like I grew up, like I was born in the late seventies, so I just grew up on a steady diet of Prince my whole life, right? Um, and so that was an amazing experience. Um, I love getting into cities and just like walking, driving like just seeing things made environments are so fascinating to me and um i would never been to minneapolis before so it was just cool to see landmarks to see things to kind of get the lay of the land um definitely checked out some breweries and that was cool so um spent a lot of time at arbiter that was um fantastic yeah. hey shouts Shout out arbiter we called it What's the Gucci, Juno, Kate, the uh anthony the uh at the party the thrive workshop we called it what would, what did we call it? It was the it was the barbecue in the back. We called it the family barbecue. That was the blackest I've seen a tap room in my life. <laughs> at that Thrive workshop. I kind of got beautiful. a little lit with you drinking Cafe Frida. <laughs> I don't know if you. It was that. like yeah, it was, it was so funny too because I was like, "Whoo, workshop's over. Now I get to chill." Yeah. And then I rolled up and I was like, "Everybody was yes. there," and I was like, "Oh, not chilling yet, friend." Because um. So you were mentioned earlier about uh, how if there's no proper HR and, and things of that nature to hang uh, and hold a, the business accountable, uh, you said that the the end result of diversity, we'll call it that, doesn't really become. So I would say, what what is is that what you would call your formula for uh, the the best effect of change? Like, would you do you think you have that down to a formula yet, or is it still kind of being you know ca calculated? Yeah, sort of. So I I mean I do have a sort of form. I'll call it a framework. This formula yeah. maybe sounds a little bit too per prescriptive, but gotcha. Um, so I think for you to ha if you're an organization and if you want to have successful right equity and inclusion work um, that kind of you know creates diversity. I think you have to have four things and I think you have to use them all. Um, so first, I think you need to have like very strong, like visioning and mission based work. Like you have to have the, the mental part and people take this for granted, right? Like they think just saying, I want to be a good guy or right. I want, I want to be diverse. Like that that's visioning and that's not vision. Right? For me, vision is the thing that explains to everybody why working on equity and inclusion is an important part of their job and why it moves the entire organization forward. So like, let's say I'm talking to like Susie on the Canon line and I'm like, Susie, you got to get down with our equity and inclusion work. And Susie's like, why? That's not going to help me get this beer in a can. And you pay me to put beer in a can, right? Um, the vision is what lets you talk to Susie and say, this is why this is important to you. This is why this is important to this organization. This is why it moves us forward, right? I used to I used to be a college professor and like the worst thing you could do to a student is have, tell them to do something and the student look at you and be like, when am I ever going to need to know this? And you don't have an answer. Right. So like you have to be able to tell every employee why what working on this is important for their job. That's the vision. Right. And I think it's super critical. Number two, I think you need to do assessment and that's for diagnosis and for seeing how you're doing. So like you have to keep track. And one of the things that I think is hilarious in terms of this is like 
There is no other major business function in which people don't do assessment. Like if you talk about sales, people are like, oh no, I'm not keeping track how many kegs we, we sold. Right? Like of course you of course you keep track. Of course you keep data. So I'm kind of like, you have to do the same thing here. If you're taking it seriously, you have to assess it. Uh, number three, you have to build systems. Um, so a lot of times what I'll see is you'll have like one very socially conscious employee who kind of drives the effort for everyone else. And then maybe that employee leaves and every little bit of knowledge and motivation leaves with that employee. So what you have to do is get everything that employee does and build it into standard operating procedure, right? SOPs. So like lists, checklists, blow, like here's your hiring kit. This is what you have to do first. Here's how you talk to people and don't act like an ass, right? Like whatever it is, write, write it down, right? Build it into the systems. Um, and then number four, training and ongoing education. And what I think is the interesting part is people do four and they don't do any of the other three. Right? So they're like, so we just have the training. And I'm like, what is the training going to be hanging on? If there's no vision, if you're not doing any benchmarking, it's not built into your systems, this is a useless training. Um, so if I had a formula or framework, that's, that's what I hang it on. Now, if you think about the systems part and the data part, right, the assessment part, those are two functions where HR is critical, right? Like they keep data about employees. So if you're tracking demographics, they hold that and they usually do it. And if you're talking about systems for hiring, promotion, professional development, departure, pipeline about all those systems are, are HR done. And HR is usually the education delivery system. So that's why I think HR is like critical, even if it's not, again, like a formal HR person or department. <coughs> it's that like management of the humans that allows you to kind of hang this equity and inclusion work on, like on the clothes hanger of HR. It's definitely needed. I, I know for the most of the breweries I've worked in, I was the single diversity person, the single black person. And, and it's, it's not a good feeling. I mean, you know, I'm sure we've all been in that position at one point or another. Definitely. definitely. Where you're the only person of color and then you have people ask you some of just the weird ass questions about stuff that don't pertain to you personally or thinking that black people are a monolith. Like, why do people do this? Or I've got I got asked questions about why do black women stuff? Black and encyclopedia. I'm, yeah, like I'm not a black woman. I can't answer some of those questions. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not your... You're black, like you say, you're black Wikipedia. That's not me. Okay, so you, you you're in a you're a consultant, right? Um, I've considered maybe stepping into a consultant role. Just just you know, I got a lot of experience. With that being the case, uh, what do you feel? All right, so I, I heard your four steps for your framework. Uh, do you feel anything besides those four steps of framework? are required to be uh, a credible, successful, maybe even, you know, just a consultant worth even calling? Is there anything else that you think would possibly one would need? Yeah, I think if you're gonna go into consulting in this space, I always tell people like, know what it is that you do and do that well, right? Don't, don't do what you don't do, if that makes sense. So like, lots of people call me and say like, can you do implicit bias training? I'm like, no. Like, I don't do that. Um, I don't do it well. Uh, research says it didn't work, right? Like, so um, I'm, I don't do what I don't do, but what? But I do know what I do, right? Like I'm, a, I'm an educator. That's how I was first trained and that's absolutely my strong set. And I, like, I am a researcher. Like I do data and I do numbers, you know? So, um, you know, I tell people like, this is the type of consulting that I can do for you. Um, because a lot of people will have a preconceived notion of like what it is they want you to do as a consultant in the space. And to be honest, most people will think they have achieved something because they hired. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I can, de I can definitely <laughs> see how that Okay. Could, how do that you know what I mean? Like, they'll be like, yeah. we hired, we hired. Right, right. Like, we, <laughs> we, we, we need to do, like, it's over. Like. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds awfully so, like tokenism. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's like, it's, a, it's, it's a journey. And I think, um, the way that I explain it with the people that I work for, uh, or that, you know, I partner with is, you know, I was just like, okay, we'll talk about house. Right. We'll talk about house metaphor. And I was like, if you want somebody to come in and like, do like fire interior design on your house. I am not the one. Wait, like you, I was like, I wear jeans and t-shirt every day of my life. I don't have style. That's why I got married. Somebody else has style. What I can do is like, make sure your plumbing works. Like that's like, I am, I am your plumber as a consultant. It's not gonna be flashy. A lot of times people are not even gonna know I was there. But like, if your toilets work, everything's fine. But the minute your toilets don't work, right, everybody's out. So I'm just kind of like, if, if, if I was there, you might not notice it. But if I wasn't there, you, you get it. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Um, we're gonna switch gears a little bit. Uh, don't really wanna bog you down too much with the, with the industry jargon. So I wanna go back to Richmond um, do you just live there? Or is that where you're natively from? I live here now. I'm I'm native Virginian, but I okay. you know I live like in pretty much every metro area in Virginia. And so this so I want have landed in Richmond. I want to ask: Have you been to Mama J's? Yeah, because that because um, I've been so to I'll Richmond you, and that is, that place um, is great. This is like one of the sadnesses of my life. So yes, I have, but I'm vegan. Oh, oh. That, I mean that's fine so, too, like, but it's like I, it's like I'm like yeah. I guess they <laughs> they probably use a lot of butter and everything and all that, and so yeah, it's a little a little like tough. On the menu. Yeah, yeah. Mama J's. Wow. I, I, we have some beautiful vegan soul food in town, but it's not. <laughs> what uh? What is, what's the name of the what the, what's the name of that place? Oh As my a gosh, shout out to the vegan. Better. There's two of them. There's one across the river that's amazing. Amazing. I'll find it before we get on. Um, amazing community building people. They have, um, they're just amazing folks. Like they're clearly, they did a food truck for a really long time. Um, and they're just trying to feed people. Like I think that's yeah. generally their mission. So like once a month, they just do free food. Just, if you come that's, in, that's, you, that's food, awesome. you just come in. Anytime you go there, you can just say, hey, I want to pay it forward. So you can just give them an extra dollar or two and say, next time you're out there just trying to feed people, here's a couple bucks, you know. Always linking up with other Black-owned businesses, elevating people, like um, just mad cool stuff. Um, you know, Kelly, her place, Urban Hang Suite, they serve some... Um, they serve some vegan stuff, which is great. Um, Eric from Capsule does their craft beer program. So, um, like, fun stuff there. So, like, there's some cool stuff, but, I mean, it's still not mom. But um, <laughs> we have some cool stuff there. <laughs> Do you ever make it down to the Secret Sandwich Society or Black Sheep? I know Black Sheep. Black Sheep might be closed now, but those are some other notable places that I remember going to. Yeah, I never made it down. Okay. I never made it down. Gotcha. Uh, Hey, so Miss, uh, what's uh, my question? Um, do you are you the one? How do you calm your when your gecko gets black spots? When your albino leopard gecko gets black spots, how do you chill it out? Because I heard that's what uh, it's indicator for that is stressed out. How do you de-stress your gecko? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Um, she so. <laughs> My, I have a leopard gecko named Ghostface Killer. Hey, hey. shouts out Wu Tang. <laughs> so, um, I didn't name her that. My students named her that because um, she's albino. So they're like, and like they always wanted to come in. My, she used to be in my office, and I would feed her, and she would just be in there like tearing up crickets and stuff. And they were like, "Dang, Ghostface Killer," you know. So, um, so me and the me and the, <laughs> the lizard kick it in my office now. I'll tell you what, I talk to my lizard a lot. That's what's up. Hey. I talk to my snakes. I have two ball pythons. I named them Dwayne and Whitley. And I talk to them all the time. All the time. Different uh, world. That's how, we, that's how we chill, mostly. I garden. Yeah. Heavy gardening. Do you let it free in the garden? Uh, so, 
What'd you say? Do you let the gecko free in the garden? I don't, but she can see it. <laughs> <laughs> Are you the one who flushes her eyes, or is that uh, left up to uh, some other family member? Uh, that is left up to someone else, a friend. What is that? that no. All right. What's All the right. flushing what eyes? What is flushing of the eyes? What is that, Phil? You gotta like flush like a lizard's eyes sometimes. Oh, word. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. <laughs> Eat the flushing, man. I did not know yeah. that. Any for you guys? Uh, so how did Crafted for All come about? Yeah. Um, so, you know, when I, when I started with the Brewers Association, um, I was still teaching full time. So, uh, professor and uh in most colleges full-time faculty are allowed to do a certain amount of consulting is it if it's related to like their research program and since um all of my research is about the craft brewing industry it was like directly related. so um no worry there uh and then in the summer of 2019 i decided to leave academia i was i was like you know what higher ed isn't for me and in like this is I always tell people leaving when you when you have like that tenure track professor job leaving is like it's like three divorces right like you it's like you're divorcing yourself because that's like your conception of who you are you're divorcing your colleagues um and like you're divorcing like tenure which is like you just get programmed to think about that constantly um so I decided to leave higher ed and um you know, ha was feeling good about it, you know, until like spring 2020 came around. And I was like, Fuck. right. Like I was like, damn, this is the worst time to leave my job. Um, and there's kind of no calling back because you got to give them like a year notice so they can hire somebody else. Right? Um, and I realized that everything I would have planned to do was in person, right? public speaking, on site consulting, right? all of these things. Um, so in the spring of 2020, I really had no idea what I was going to do with my life, like really. Um, and then, you know, uh, the like, I, I talk about this a lot with, with Ren Navarro up in Canada, like how, how the murder of George Floyd was this like, this watershed moment for both of us, right? Where I was like, the week before I was like, I'm going to go to Home Depot and see if I can pick up some hours. And then the next week, everyone, like I couldn't walk away from my phone, right? Because so many people were calling um, and so many people were emailing. Um, and, you know, I had already been thinking about like, what is the next move? I can't deliver my services during COVID. I can't be in person. But one of the things I kind of realized was, Consulting is an interesting model because you can't scale yourself as a consultant. You only have so many hours and you can only be so many places. And so you tend to like, the way you scale is to take bigger jobs, right? Bigger companies, longer engagements. And so what I realized is I was speaking at events, you know, 200, 300 people in a room or I was consulting with like some of the bigger breweries, uh, craft breweries in the country. And I was like, the people who heard me speak are like, word, and then they go back to the brewery when the conference is over, right? And then they're, and then it's like, oh gosh, why call chiller broken, right? They don't have time to remember what they said. And if everybody emails me and be like, what'd you say, Dr. J? Like, I, I can't return 200 emails, right? Um, and then the people who can afford to bring you on, that's great. But I realized you're really not serving a lot of people that way. Like it, it, it took COVID for me to kind of be like, I'm actually not serving the industry very well, right? Like I'm serving deep pockets and then everybody else gets a drive by at the conference. Um, so Craft for All was really about trying to reach as many businesses as possible wherever they needed to be. So uh, we have like a subscription service that's on via Patreon and like cheapest five bucks a month, right? Not never more than $50 a month. Uh, 
we still do a little bit of consulting. We do a lot of resource development. So it's really about like, what can we do to like serve as much of the community as possible rather than like the two kind of weird extremes. And that, that's kind of where crafted for all people. Do you believe, uh, based off of what, what you experienced through COVID and, uh, you know, switching kind of lanes in your career field, do you feel like this is, do you feel it leads or defends against the uh, predestination and free will existing? As a philosopher, as a philosopher, someone who studied philosophy, do you feel like what occurred to you is predestination or do you feel it's free will? Do you feel like that happened of your own will? Or do you feel like it was destiny? If not, do you feel like they exist or do you think it strikes to that? Yeah, this is such a good question, right? Um, so for the past couple of years, I've been like really obsessed with the idea of purpose. Like what is my purpose? Or like, is the work, is the work I'm doing purposeful, right? Um, and like, right, reading books, listening to the podcast, trying to get all the like information I can about this, like how and why is this happening? And I think, um, I think I'll kind of meet you in the middle, right? I think, um, so when you experience stress, whether it's like physical stress or emotional trauma, right, your body reverts to kind of fight and flight, right, that mode. And one of the interesting things about fight and flight is like, your body basically is like, we'll have time for all your bullshit, like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So like, it actually does things to your, like, neurology to make you a little bit more impulsive so that like, you don't like, like, cause you don't have time to think, right? If you are fight or flight, it's like, go like period and i think the interesting thing about about social unrest about um right about like people marching around my town with assault weapons because they want statues not to be torn down about right like um about right infectious disease about all of those things is it you're kind of low-key fight or flight like a lot, often. Um, that's why everybody's so damn tired. But I think what it did was it made me stop thinking so much about what I'm doing and just go. Right? So I think I got closer to my, like my true purpose. Um, and I think for me, maybe that is like my equivalent to like predestined. Like I, I got closer when I couldn't think about it so much because I was in a state of like either secondary trauma or experiencing stress. All right, so I'm not 100% sure what your ethnicity is. However, uh, based off of what you were just stated with that, knowing that brewing has been predated to ancient Egypt, the Mayans, do you feel what your purpose is linked in some way to our ancestors out there in the Mayans or in ancient Egypt? Do you feel like they thrive or they move through you? Do you feel like in some way, uh, genetically through the long, you know, tether that that is, do you feel that that links you and uh, uh, kind of drives their purpose forward to kind of remind people like, hey, yeah, we we been in here too. Y'all y'all was doing it like this, but the Germans was doing what they was doing, but not before we was doing what we, what we was doing. And we're here to remind you. Yeah, that's so great because you asked this. So, um, so I'll tease it a little bit. I can't give you too many details, but I'm, um, I'm working on a beer, uh, like television series, uh, and a script that I was writing. Literally yesterday, I was with the, with the production team yesterday talking about the script, and it's about um, beer in the five cradles of civilization, right? So. Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, um, the Peruvian river basin and the Andes, um, Mesoamerica, so Gulf Coast and Central America, 
in uh, northern China, Yellow River Basin. Um, and in all five of those cradles of a civilization, there is archaeological evidence that points to not just the brewing of beer, but the organized brewing of beer, right? Large scale brewing of beer and how connected it is to, um, to early civilization. Um, for me, this is so, it's a, it's a theme that kind of weaves in and out of my life, like at so many different points. Um, and I think for me, it often just comes down to fermentation, right? Even if you look at, um, right, the alchemists in the kind of early first millennia, right, they were like, you know, they try to make gold out of lead, so whatever. But if you look, <laughs> but if you look at the seven, right, major processes of alchemy, right, fermentation is one of them. Um, and, you know, for me, it's always been the sense that, like, um, what all humans do collectively is change. Like, that is something we are, none of us are immune to change. Change and transformation is what we do. And I think in my life, the humans that I admire the most or who I think are most successful, and that doesn't necessarily mean dollars, right? Just successful humans are the ones who, like, sees that sense of change and transformation and like right lean into it and so fermentation as 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 a type of kind of like basic transformation that is literally like in the air right like it's it, it's all around us all the time being able to harness it is something that um like i tell people i'm like the reason we like Harry Potter is because magic is compelling, but like fermentation is, is the closest thing to magic on the planet, right? And like you can access it at any moment, at any time. And you know, what our ancestors did, right, was access. They accessed it constantly. Um, whether you're talking about miso, right, in, uh, in Asia, or whether you're talking about beer and in any and every culture, sauerkraut, kimchi, right? Like they're like fermentation is elemental. And I think, um, yeah, I, I absolutely think that connects us both to kind of past and future. Like I think, again, because change is that one constant we have. So you would call your metamorphosis of uh, fermentation of your life? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people yeah. with people with minimal resources can ferment things like mm -hmm. people ferment things in prison for, man. you know, what I mean, prison like man. people, prison wine. yeah, like, you know, so that's that's at the base of humanity as a whole. If you even look at it that way, yeah, that's fascinating. Fair so enough. we got uh, I got one last question for you, Dr. J. Yeah, why, you, why we still have you? Yeah. What do you do for fun away from the industry? What's what's your go to? Couple different things. So I tell people, like, I just like making things. Like I'm a, I'm a maker, like at heart. So, um, so I'm the huge, like most of my yard is a garden. I don't believe in grass. It's not productive. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> Big shout nice. out to that. <laughs> a, a, a fan now. I hate grass. Thank you. Shout out. Grass is, turf grass is the, is the tyranny of suburbia. It is oh, the tyranny of suburbia. And you, all you do is mow it and put money in it so you could look across the yard and you know try to one up your neighbor put some food in the ground grow some food grow some flour there you go. make something sustainability yeah, man. yeah. Get some bees yeah that's cracking. what we need for sure come on you got a honey farm what'd you say you got like a beehive making some honey uh we don't have bees not yet um but let's see uh so blueberries raspberries blackberries, nectarines, two varieties of grapes, peaches, and uh, some crab apples. Those are all the fermentation things that I grow. So that's all for beverage. Um, all sorts of, um, all sorts of vegetables, uh, all seasons. And then right now I have some White Widow, Northern Lights, Blue Dream, in the backyard. I'm proud of you. Ooh. I'm proud of you. Is this uh, speaking, speaking the language? You know exactly what she's talking about. Bro. Yes, talking, we do. It's understood. Doesn't need to be said, my friend. No, no, no. I'm saying, but are we talking like you know, like full scale, or we, <laughs> you know, 
Uh, and so Virginia has limited limited personal use cultivation. Really? So, Got um, you. Uh, that's always in the garden as well. You know, I, 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 I'm a more retired um, So that spot. gardening, um, building stuff, like I always got some like pile of scrap wood, uh, building some stuff. I like knitting, like f- fiber arts. Um, so like really, I'm one of those people who are like, if I'm doing something with my hands, it releases my mind. Right? Beautiful, beautiful. Well, um, unless anybody else has anything else, I'd like to thank you for your time. Anybody else have anything? I would love to thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. It has definitely been a pleasure. It's been very insightful as well. Thank you for allowing us to dive into your mind. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Um, so when am I going to see you again? Uh, I will be at GABF. I know you won't be there, but hopefully we can make it. I don't know if you're going to be at the Harlem Brew Festival this year. I don't know. Where is it? In Harlem. Down in Harlem, oh, Celeste. Harlem. NYC, Celeste over yeah, there. Yeah, Celeste from uh, Harlem Brewery. You know, she's down in Fayetteville. She's, you know, she's been running that for yeah. like 20 years now. And she gave us an invitation to be there and do some things. So hopefully there, I know you won't be at GABF. Where else are you going to be at there? Maybe we can be at to, uh, to see you in person again. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, no, I'm going to be in Atlanta for Blacktoberfest. I'll be down there. Um, okay. okay. ATL, we might have to take a trip. Definitely. Sure. I'll be um, in Chicago for CiderCon because um, working with a lot of people in Cider. Love those folks. Mm. Um, when, when is, is CiderCon? Chicago, I think early February. Okay, gotcha. right, that's on the calendar. Yeah, that, we we calendar it right we now. We can do that. I spent a, I spent <laughs> a lot of time you know in what? Chicago. I mean, it's, CiderCon is it, it's like surprisingly wonderful. Like that's what I always tell people. Like if you're a beer person. Go to CiderCon, get into it. Like, um, it'll kind of like it almost like puts a wind in your sails. Where you're like, oh yeah, this is everything I love about beer, right? Like, um, back into cider, and um, I learn so much every time I go. I learn, I've learned so much, and that really helps my beer knowledge. It's amazing. So, um, big recommend there. Obviously, Nashville for CBC next year. Um, so I'll be around. I'll be around and I will look for Okay. Yeah, well, you'll probably see me next when you want to uh, invite me to your crib for the uh, cultivation of your uh, herbaceous plants and uh, I'll write about them. <laughs> we, you know, we yeah. can do that too. I need some nectarines and peaches. I'm a citrus guy. <laughs> well, thank you again, Dr. J. It's been a pleasure having you once again. Uh, I'm sure we'll see you again soon because the Chicago Cidery uh, Cider Con sounding sounding like something that we actually Very could do make it to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And we'll keep in touch. Definitely. Thank All you, right. Dr. J. Cool, Appreciate yeah. your time. Cheers. Well. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.